ask for you to turn quickly to Luke chapter 19 this morning, Luke chapter 19 for our scripture reading, and then we're going to be going to Revelation chapter 19, Luke chapter 19, and we're going to pick up at the very end of our Jerusalem journey where Jesus is uh, going through the city. The crowd is, uh, at this point in time, into inviting Jesus to be their king. But remember, it was to be their king on, his ter- on their terms. And now we come to an interesting transition uh, that takes place here. And in this transition, he's challenged by the Pharisees to silence the crowd. Over several hundred thousand were probably there that filled the streets of Jerusalem. A multitude of voices, the sound of, of many waters is what we would find and we read in Revelation. The voice of the angels and the archangels and everything. The sound of many waters and this is what Jesus is hearing in the city streets. So in Luke chapter 19, we'll pick up our reading at verse 36. And as he went, they spread their their cloths or garments in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now to the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hast known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, encompass thee around, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave thee one stone upon another, because thou knowest not the time of thy visitation. Father, help us in these, uh, these brief moments in your word this very critical, this very crucial turning point in Jesus' ministry and that of the crowd to bless our hearts with insight, wisdom, and understanding and application of your word here today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Remember just what was the theme of the sermon last Sunday, the journey into Jerusalem, was the fact that the people did not research and mine out the whole counsel of God. They interpreted what Jesus was doing according to their own understanding of the times and the seasons. And as a result of that, they came up with a false false notion that Jesus was to be their king as in an emperor, as a conqueror, as in one that would take over the Roman. Jesus understood that. Nevertheless, he allowed them to continue uh, the, the chant and the praise as he's entering into the city street. He did that for a reason. He wanted them to see the fallacy of their own heart, the error of their own ways, which would be revealed by Friday of that same week. So now we pick up at a point in time that uh, the disciples in verse 39, and some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto him, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. There's two thoughts I would like to draw from this passage and then taking us to Revelation. The first is this. We want to look at the the sorrow and then in Revelation, the celebration of Jesus. This is a time of sorrow for our Savior. And it's not a time of celebration. He feels the grief. He acknowledges what is really going to take place and the true condition of their heart. You know, when you're a parent, when you're a pastor, when you're a counselor, and, uh, and you don't even have to be that. You can be a coach, you can be whatever you want. And you know uh, that when somebody is on a trek, a journey, and they talk to you about it, and they're, they're kind of like they're bent on their own way, but yet down deep inside, you know in your heart that this is not right. This is not the way that you want to see them to go. And uh, there have been marriage counseling sessions in my, in my past whereby this is, these people were not meant to be together. You can call it God's will all you want. You cannot come to terms and agreements with each other. But nevertheless, there's an insistence, and that's what you see here. Jesus is allowing the people to have their way, but there's going to be a price to be paid. And then when the Pharisees enter into it, they tell them, rebuke thy disciples. 
Notice Jesus' wording here, and he answered and said unto them, I tell you that, you know, right now, at this point in time, if these, these people should hold their peace, and they would, eventually by the end of the week, they are going to hold their peace. They are not going to be shouting Hosanna in the highest. They are not going to be praising him for the mighty works that he did, raising of the dead, Lazarus and the blind men and uh, Zacchaeus. Uh, None of that. They're not going to praise him for that. They will hold their peace. And when they do, not if they do, but they do, he answers it this way. The stones will immediately cry out. Now, ordinarily, we would say that means that if somebody doesn't praise Jesus, the rocks will. And as a matter of fact, we sing a, a choir number that the rocks will cry out. We have to put this passage, these words, in context. And the context is the rejection of the Messiah. They are not receiving him as the the Davidic king, as the one that would rule and reign in their hearts, the kingdom of God, the king over their own hearts and their lives. This, what we read, is what Habakkuk was speaking of in Habakkuk chapter 2. And uh, in that, in verse 11, I want you to pick up at verse 10. Thou shalt consult uh, consulted shame to thy house by cutting off many people and has sinned against thy soul. For the stone shall cry out of the wall and the beam out of the timber shall answer it. He's given us the metaphorical language, the illustration that as Jerusalem falls, as the people reject God, he is going to say that the, the rocks will cry out to the timber and the timber will answer them. And more than likely, it's going to be Why did they do this? Why did they reject all of the offers that they had? Jerusalem has fallen. The people are fallen. They've rejected God. And here is what Jesus was referring to when he says, if they hold their peace, they will stop crying, Hosanna in the highest. The rocks are going to scream. The wording there where the rocks immediately cry out as they will scream. And they will scream the fact that here are a people that rejected the very gift, Jesus Christ, that God has given to them. Now the turning point. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and he wept over it. Another very strong Greek word. You got to get the picture. Just imagine the throngs of people. He's wading through all of the garments. The palm branches are being tossed to the ground. And as as this caravan of Jesus and the disciples and, and the Pharisees are wading through all of this, he comes close to the city. And in the midst of all of that, he stops. And the weeping is, is that of a convulsion. It's a kind of weeping, a sobbing that is uncontrollable as in the death of a loved one, of a child unexpectedly, and the parent just sobs. This is Jesus' heart over those that are celebrating falsely his Messiahship. He knows where this is going to take them. And from that, I think there's a very important lesson that we can learn from this, and that is this that the, the heart of Jesus Christ is interested in the well-being and the good of his people, and it breaks his heart tremendously when people reject the very gift of the gospel that he offers, and he does that now through the preaching of the word, the church, and you and I. Jesus is kind of like the, uh, the child at a, at a, or a, a bride at a wedding, a child at his birthday party, and everybody else is celebrating, and here is the one that is being recognized is sobbing. There might be different reasons for that in a real-life situation, but Jesus weeping was because of the rejection of him to the people. And he says in verse 42, If thou hast known even thou the least, at least in this thy day, on this day, the things which belong to your peace, here I am, here is the gospel, but now they are hid from their eyes. It's a, a providential blindness. In other words, They already rejected him. It's been a fight all of these three years, and they rejected him. And so now that rejection of their own, God holds them to that, and they will not see the true Jesus even to this very day where Israel rejects the Messiah. Now, yes, some have come to know Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 
clarifies that there is the enmity that was between God and man, between the Gentiles and the Jews, have become one through the blood. He's broke down that middle wall of partition. But the sorrow of Jesus is, the, is that because he came unto his own, and his own received him not. We move now to Revelation chapter 19. We go to Revelation chapter 19 and we see the celebration. There's an interim time in between what you see there. It goes to the cross. The Holy Spirit descends. The church is um, now enshrined. The church becomes the bride of Christ. The word of God goes forward. Jews and Gentiles alike now become one body in Christ. Time passes. We are in that grace period. We now come to the book of Revelation Seven years, we have the rapture of the church, the tribulation period has passed. We come to chapter 19, we pick up our reading at verse 1. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he has judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat upon the throne, saying, Amen. Alleluia. And a voice came from the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, the voice of many waters, the voice of the mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice, give honor to him, and for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready today. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he said unto me, Write, Behold, blessed are they which called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb, and said unto me, These are the true sayings of God. What a beautiful picture. Notice things that are common, and yet notice those which are opposite of what we see in Jerusalem. And I think the most important is the common voice of the people. The wording is somewhat the same. There's an alleluia, there is the praise, but this comes from genuine heart. This, these praises, this multitude of voices, the sound of rolling waters, comes from a people that are redeemed. They've lived their time, they're now in heaven, and they have the whole counsel of God. They are right according to God's plan, and they are lifting up Jesus Christ and God and honoring him for the great works that he has done. This is the way that it is meant to be. So this is Jesus' coronation day. This is the day of celebration. This is the day that the groom receives the bride. And we know from our studies, the bride is the church, the, the body of Christ. Those in verse um, 7, and his wife made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saint. It's not the righteousness that we do on our own. Uh, even our own righteousness today falls short of the imputed righteousness that we receive from Jesus Christ. We've been clothed with the righteousness of Christ. We've been called upon to, to live rightly and godly and justly in, in, in humility. But what we have, this, this wedding garment, has already been, in one sense, issued out. You receive the garment the moment that you come to the saving faith in Jesus Christ. You might say that you, you wear that wedding garment now, although we cannot see it, but that is what allows us to be at this marriage supper. Without that garment, you would not be here. But then there seems to be the, the issuing out, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed. Uh, perhaps it's a language of a, a whiter garment, something that is brighter. You see, in Ephesians chapter 4, and, Jesus, and Paul writes about Jesus Christ and the bride of Christ, that he should cleanse and wash her with the washing of the water by the uh, word of God. And as he gets through that and he puts out 
the relationship of Christ and the church as the bride, and the husband and her rela- in his relationship with his wife, in nourishing and cherishing it, even as Christ did the church, so that he can be the church be present faultless before God. Here we are at that point. This is the celebration day for Jesus Christ. So as we depart from these scriptures this morning, we're left with two very simple questions. Three, to make, put it into context of the cantata, the first is going to be this. And that is, do you know Christ as your Savior? Are you here in this auditorium or out and you're listening by way of live stream? And maybe you have the heart of the crowd of Jerusalem. You sing praise, you praise God, but yet you've not embraced him. You're not receiving him as Jesus presented himself. You see his mighty works, and you like the things that God does. But have you called upon him to be your king, your Lord, and your master through, through faith, trusting him as the one that as a journey to the cross would bring about the, the pardon for your sin? That is our first question. Our second question is this, and it follows along suit, if that is the case, are you living the righteousness of Christ? We've been given the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and he is our substitute, or he that knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of Christ, of God in Jesus Christ. So yes, that is true. What about our living? Do we live righteously, honoring God's word, responding to the challenges and the convictions of the Holy Spirit? And our third question would be this answering to ourselves, is he worthy? The Bible says that he is. But do we give him the respect of worthiness in all areas, in all aspects, in all avenues of our life? It's a challenging question. We have a thousand ways in which in the course of a week we can demonstrate our allegiance and show that Christ is worthy of all glory and praise and honor. And we we use the expression that whatsoever we do in word or deed, we do all to the glory of God. We must think of the many different ways and the opportunities then through our, our obedience, the choice of our words, our friends, our relationship, our activities, is that we do that as, as a means of saying, honoring God, his word comes first, he knows all things. And so we live in that such a manner and a fashion that he is honored, dignified, glorified by our actions and our response and our activities in life. Is he worthy? Is he your savior? Do you have that garment? Has it been issued to you already? And will you receive it again, the fine linen of the righteousness of the saints. Father, help us today as we journey home now and we we rest for the afternoon, but let these words, our loving Savior who wept over Jerusalem, even in their error, he would still weep over them. And help us, Father, to have that same burden and that same compassion for the lost. Father, grant to us the blessing of knowing that we've been restored and renewed have by coming to saving faith in Jesus Christ. Give us the heart to constantly be saying, he is worthy. He is worthy of all power and honor and praise and glory in our day-by-day walk, uplifting him above all else. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.